Morning, ladies and gents. Simon Brown here with another Market Standard. Friday, we're focusing on exchange-traded funds, and in particular, the promised bond funds, ETFs. We've got local and offshore, and we'll touch on some others as well. First, we delve into what are bonds. Then we'll look at the ETFs. We'll look at alternatives, PREF shares, retail government bonds, uh, and then I'll take questions at the end, as always. Um, so start off, bonds 101. So bonds are debt instruments. They're typically issued by governments, uh, state-owned enterprises, companies. In the US, you'll find municipalities issuing them, and, and even a little in South Africa, and you'll find little towns. But predominantly, it's going to be government, uh, SOE, state-owned enterprises, companies who ish, issue them. And they're issuing them to raise debt. You know, so you know, the South African government needs extra cash every month, every, every week. We uh, spend more than we receive in tax, so we need to raise debt. You don't go to a bank to raise that sort of a debt. You go to the bond market and you issue in what's called the primary market. That's when you issue, and then it trades in the secondary market. Uh, not directly investable for private clients, just because of the limitations. They typically are issued in denominations of a million uh, czar, sometimes 10 million czar per bond. And the way it works is National Treasury uh, twice a week basically goes to market and says, we require this czar value of bonds, and it then lets people bid for them. Uh, and as recently as last week, the, the, the demand for our local government bonds was about four times what Treasury was looking to raise. So there's still plenty of demand. If that demand starts to disappear, well, you raise the rate to re-attract it. If you're getting too much demand, you can lower the rate and you'll have a peak at that in, in just a moment. The key point there is it, it's not investable for private clients, which you know, if, if you're a high net worth, you can go chat, you can probably get into it, but for the majority of us, not. They are fixed term. In other words, that bond will be valid for a period. It, it, it's typically not less than a year or two, sometimes five or 10 years, occasionally 30 years. Uh, I think Argentina and one of the European states has issued 100-year bonds, um, which sounds crazy, but they did, and they were totally subscribed to. So the duration will be fixed, um, and then either fixed or floating coupon rate. Now, the coupon rate is essentially the interest rate. That could be fixed. It could be floating. So if it's fixed, it's 10%. You'll get 10% a year if you buy that bond and you hold it to expiry. And at the end of it, you get the bond value back. So you put a million in, you get your 10%, 100K a year, usually paid by annual. And then in 10 years time, you get your money back. You will get some that are inflation linked. And what that is typically is CPI plus a rate. And that rate will be uh, currently it's around 3% or so. So whatever inflation is, your capital grows by the inflation amount. And then on top of that, you're going to get the, the, the interest payment coming through. They can also be linked to other rates. They can be linked to credit ratings. But typically, they're either fixed or they've, they're linked to inflation. As I said, coupons paid at fixed intervals, typically by annual or annual. Sometimes they will wrap that up and pay it to you at the end. For example, a 10-year bond paying 10% but only paying at the end, that's 100000 a year. Rolled up, you get a million for your, your initial bond, that you, the money you lent, and a million for your 10% uh, 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 that you've received. But it's not compounding. Note the trick there. Um, Coupon is linked to rate and amount on issue. So this is very important. I'm going to come to it in the next slide. The yield up, price down. How do we price bonds? Um, your coupon is linked to the rate and amount on issue. So you issue a bond today for 10 years. It's a million bucks. You're paying 12%. If I buy it today and I hold it for that entire period, I will get my 12% every year paid to me. The distinction is, is that if you're buying and trading it in the secondary market, then things get tricky. And this is where bonds get confusing sometimes. The rule of thumb is, not the rule of thumb, the rule is yield up means price down. Price up means yield down. So let's look at that top line. You issue a 1,000 Rand bond issued at a fixed 12% yield. It is going to pay 120 Rand interest per year. That's what it pays, 120 bucks per year over the duration of that bond. That's if you buy it in the primary market. Then it moves into the secondary market where it starts to trade. And let's say there's demand for this bond. So the demand will naturally push the price up. The price initially, it's trading at 1,000 Rand. 
you know, that's what the loan value to the bank is. It's trading at a thousand, and therefore that's what it's worth. But demand pushes it to trade up to a thousand two hundred. Now, what happened is the price has gone up of the bond, but the yield has gone down. Why? Because if you buy at a thousand two hundred rand, you're still only getting that hundred and twenty rand per year because the interest is fixed on the issue amount, and therefore your yield is effectively only ten percent. The inverse. You get downgraded to so the bond, thousand rand bond you issued. No one wants it. They start selling it, and suddenly it's trading down at eight hundred rand. Now, if you buy it at eight hundred rand, you will receive one hundred and twenty rand interest per year. That's fifteen percent. So yes, the yield at issue, which is that primary market, and if you buy at issue and hold until expiry, you will get that yield. But most people, you know, the, the traders out there, the, the, the income funds and all of that, is that they're constantly buying and selling for multiple reasons because they've got cash coming in to invest. They've got cash that they need to generate to pay investors, etc. And therefore, we see the, 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 the value amount move and that then impacts on that yield. You still get the 120%, but you paid a different price. And if you paid a higher price, lower yield, paid a lower price, a higher yield. This makes sense because this is quite important. I'm going to show you some slides in a bit. We can certainly come back to it when we hit the, the, the questions later on. Um, but this is always it basically yield up, price down. Price up, yield down. So here is our 10 year bond, the R618, uh, which is the one that is most often referenced. Um, and you can see a couple of interesting things, but let's first look at those two periods. One is December 2015 when Nkinkla Nene was fired. As our finance minister, we had Des Van Royen for a weekend, and then we got um, uh, Pribin Gordon coming in on the uh, Monday morning. Um, on the far right-hand side, we can see the 2020 collapse in our bonds, and what happened there was our downgrade to junk, uh, and frankly, even more than that, was our uh, the, 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 the coronavirus, COVID-19, spreading across the world, and ultimately, going into lockdown. In both of those spikes, what happened? Investors were selling our bonds. They no longer wanted to hold them for a bunch of reasons, most notably concerns around a fired finance minister and, of course, junk status. But what you'll also notice is that both times they then recovered, and particularly down in 2018, we actually hit 8%. And what happened there was investors, after the initial sell-off, started buying our bonds. Why? Well, they liked the yield. Back in March of this year, you could buy our 10-year bond and it was going to pay you 10.5%. For a, even for an emerging market bond, that is a very, very attractive yield. So investors started buying it, and as they buy it, price a yield down, price up, and we can now see that our yield is back to 9%. That is as of yesterday. Uh, I haven't, I actually didn't check this morning. It had momentarily actually dropped below that level, but certainly well, it's what we're seeing. Uh, Fred, you are correct. So what the inflation-linked bond is, is it's inflation plus. So let's say it's inflation plus 3.5%. Your capital will increase by inflation. So the amount that you get paid out at the end of the period and the amount that you earn interest on every six months will increase by the inflation, CPI in our case. And then you get paid the, the three whatever percent it is on that capital amount. It's actually a great product. If your inflation, if your personal inflation kind of tracks CPI, it's a really great product, but tax implications. <clears throat> uh, Richard, I see your question. I'll come to those in a moment. There's, there's lots of, of, of nuances. US bonds have been, so Richard's asking about US bonds and I'll come to the nuances of the last week. The US bonds have been seeing yields go down for literally decades. Um, and the reason is people have been buying US bonds. Uh, who are those people? Well, partly it's been the U.S. Fed, but it's also been investors with the U.S. Uh, you know, Treasury notes considered the, the safest investment in the world after U.S. dollars. Now, U.S. dollars pays you zero, so you go and buy a U.S. Treasury bond at a couple of percentage points, one, two, maybe three percent, and then you get a pretty much risk-free. The U.S. is not going to default. So junk status. Uh, which we are now officially in for the last month. So some investment mandates prevent pre prevent those investment managers from buying junk bonds. <clears throat> I 
which means quite simply, there will be investment managers who owned and have to sell our bonds, and there will be investment managers who didn't own but are now prevented from buying our bonds. We also fall out of the City uh, World Government Bond Index. Uh, that will happen at the end of April. Got delayed by a month. Truthfully, we were a very small fish in that very giant pond. It is, you know, 10 or so billion of bonds that need to be sold. There are a number of ETFs that track that index, uh, fund managers and the like, and they will therefore be selling. Truthfully, they're probably selling ahead of, but we can see probably a lot of selling activity next week. But ultimately, a yield still attracts buyers, and we can see it moving from 10.5 to 9%. Buyers like that attractive yield. Is it enough to offset the sellers in the short term? No. But if we go back to that there, I mean, look what happened after the firing of Nklankla Nene. Uh, we spiked out to almost 10 and a half. And then we came all the way back, what, uh, three years later, three and a half years later, to trade around eight. And then we collapsed out again. And then we all the way back, beginning of 2020, to trade below 8%. And now we're at nine, having collapsed to 10 and a half. So there are a number of local bond ETFs and offshore bond ETFs. Uh, track, so does the ABLE track open market bond? Yes, it does. Um, uh, EJ, good question. What is the code I am using? And I can never remember it, so let me go and call it. So this is, I'm using uh, IRIS, which is also viewpoint, r186.yfx, r186.yfx. Uh, and I use the 186 because it's our 10 years, so it's our most uh, utilized reference bond. So five local and one money market account, essentially, we've got the Ashburton inflation linked so it's the yield plus CPI bonds it's buying. Um, or actually, it should be the other way around, CPI plus yield. We've got the One Invest, which is a local bond index, the LB, the All Bond Index, as it's called. Uh, ABS has also got an inflation linked that reinvests, so it doesn't pay out dividends. We've got the NFGV, which tracks the LB, and again, reinvests the, the coupons, so it doesn't pay out distribution. Citrix has got an inflation linked, again, also reinvests. So the NFLB, the NFGAVI, and the Citrix uh, ILB all reinvest. The ETF bond and the ASH inflation linked do not. They pay out distributions. And then we've got what we call, what I call the Tracy, NFTRCI, which is basically a money market rate. And let me show you what that looks like. It is the straightest line you're ever going to see. It basically just increases every day by the money market divided by 365 because it's per day and slowly it chugs along and basically gives you a cash rate. It is, however, running, last time I worked the numbers at around five and a half, six percent a year. There are perhaps better cash rates you can get out there, but you need to crunch that for yourself. But let's look at two of these bonds. So the NFGAVI, which is the most popular, what do we see happen when markets collapsed? So did it. Why? Well, yield went up, so price went down. People were selling our bonds. It has recovered after falling almost 20%. It's recovered about half of those losses, a little over 10% off. Now, as and when, if they were buying new bonds, you would have found yourself getting a, a better distribution. The point is we buy bonds broadly for you know nice and, and boring, and we've kind of had it. This is a quarter of the five-year chart that we're looking at. It's not bad, but it's nowhere near that money market I just showed you. There's still some volatility there, um, and you certainly were not protected during the sell-off. In theory, bonds and equities should have an inverse correlation, right? One goes up, one goes down. In practice, when times get crazy, like we saw in February and into March, uh, everything is correlated to one. And what I mean by that is everything goes down. Here's the Ashburton inflation, which truthfully over five years had been going down anyway, was about uh, a little under 10% down over the five-year period, and then also collapsed in the, in, the, in the late Feb, early March, and then has recovered again to get most of them back. But if, you know, if you're looking for a short-term protection for cash, bonds are not necessarily it. They're wild, crazy beasts, and they will trade and fluctuate just as much. Some global. Uh, we've got an Ashburton World Government Index. We've got a One Invest G7 Government Bond Index. 
<clears throat> and then two from RMB, one tracking the two-year U.S. Treasury and the other tracking the two to 10-year, a blend of two and 10-year U.S. Treasuries. Those obviously all U.S. dollar priced, but trading in ZAR, so you get currency as well. And right at the bottom is a, issued by ABSA, is a Namibian bond index. I, I, I vaguely remembered we had that, but I truthfully had forgotten that that, that existed. Um, so you can go get some Namibian government bonds at the same time. The point of the offshore bonds is twofold. Way, way, way lower yields. You know, your yields in Europe um, are around zero. Uh, even your Greek bonds have come back to low single-digit yields. Compared to what we're getting in South Africa with the currently 9% and a little while ago at 10.5%, and this is the attraction of our local bonds relative to global bonds. The flip side is, of course, is that we're buying them in ZOS as the RAND weakens against the US dollar, we get the offset. So he has the, uh, the G7 from uh, One Invest, and you see that massive move happening in 2020, where it's adding ah, 20%, 25%. I mean, it was doing nicely already, but let's look at a couple of things. So there's not much time here in terms of chart because it's a relatively new ETF. Certainly, we're getting some volatility, moves from 8 82.50 down to 72.50, and in fact, down to 71 ish. Those are 10, 12 percent moves, and then rallies back up, etc. But that last move has been Zar weakness because he has the same index, but there's a IGLO which is, would trade on Web Trader again, check, tracking the G7s, um, but this is this time in US dollars. So there will be some currency moves there because some of those G7 obviously are European nations, so that would be Euro. Uh, you've got Canada, that is Canadian dollar, and then obviously predominantly US dollar. But you can see the move over the period is call it 15%, and that is from almost 2009 to date. So, you know, an 11 year move, and you've essentially netted 15%. And that's what you're going to see in the offshore bond market. What we're seeing here is our weakness. And if our RAND now goes back to 12 um, from the current 19 or so, uh, expect that chart to reverse and go through the bottom of the equation. So a range of, of, of local uh, bond ETFs, uh, a couple of offshore ETFs, as a bond ETFs, including one in Namibia, but you're going to get significantly lower rates on those excluding Namibian. On the local ones, you'll obviously get the much better rates. Other alternatives, preference shares. These are issued by companies. There's no market makers as opposed to with an ETF. And they pay dividends linked to prime and prime rate and the issue price of those debt instruments. So you pay dividend withholding tax at 20%. Bonds pay interest, there's tax. I'll come to that in a moment. For some of you, DWT might at 20% might be less than your interest in, than the tax you pay. For others, it may be more. If you're in the 45% tax bracket, maybe it's worth it. However, some very attractive yields lurking here. But the yields that we're seeing at the moment are historic. And what we're seeing this year is a 2% drop in prime. And as I state here, the dividends are linked to prime. So those is typically that around between about 70 and 85% of the prime rate. They pay that on the issue price. What I mean, SBPP, for example, which is the standard bank preference share, has an issue price of 100 Rand. Technically, it's 100 Rand debt to standard bank, but it's trading at 70. So you're actually buying it below its notational value. However, the payment to you will be determined, the interest payment will be determined on the 100 Rand issue price multiplied by prime, multiplied by the percentage paid. Um, you've also got the fact that whilst these are preference shares, they, the, the dividends can be cancelled or delayed. Um, particularly, uh, so you can't pay a normal shareholder dividend without first paying a preference because preference shareholders have preference. The point being, quite simply, um, is that it can be skipped. So dividends are not certain. And of course, the issuer could go bankrupt. I mean, unlikely. Uh, and, and there's a bunch of them. And they're, you know, they're the big banks and the sort of first and second tier corporates. But uh, African Bank had preference shares and went bankrupt. Steinhoff had preference shares and collapsed. So there certainly is a risk there. There is an ETF preference share basket uh, from Core Shares. PrefTX is its code, and if we go have a look at it, uh, uh, 
you will see that it has also sold off fairly markedly uh, in 2020 as concerns around preference shares has raised its head. Are those concerns justified or not? Don't know, but certainly the market has them. Another option, and this is not JC traded, so you can't buy it from online share trading or Standard Bank. You've got to go direct to the retail government bonds. Google them, you'll find the website. So these are inflation linked, which is CPI growth of your of your capital plus the 350, 375 points on top. The ones on the left hand side are fixed. So five year fixed at 11.5%, zero costs. Um, and you are essentially, I mean, if the SA government goes bankrupt, you join a queue. But you know, this is small tomatoes for them to pay and easy to pay because they own the printing press. So in essence, you can get 11.5%. Here, uh, dividends are paid by annual or coupons. And if, you are, uh, if you're a pensioner, you can receive monthly. Um, you can request the money to be reinvested so you get some compound interest impact. And these rates change every month. The end of April, the rates will change. I suspect they will come back down, probably to around 9%, because that's what we've seen our tenure do, and broadly, they track our tenure. Tax, so bonds pay interest, not dividends. The preference shares pay dividends, the rest pay interest. Uh, if you're under 65, your first 23,800 of interest is tax-free. If you're over 65, it's 34,500 of interest is tax-free. Thereafter, interest received is added to taxable income. So depending what tax bracket you're in and how much interest you are receiving, it could be quite a lot. You can, of course, the ETFs, you can put those into tax-free accounts, so you could then avoid it completely and absolutely. But don't do that if you're earning under the 23.8 or the 34.5 because then there's no benefit government was already giving you. Importantly, these two numbers have not gone up since tax free was introduced, and I don't expect them to. So we'll look at more coming next Friday. Uh, tell me what ETFs you might be interested in to cover next Friday holiday, so week after ETFs and funds. Uh, and remember, everything is on the YouTube channel. Uh, folks, you got questions from our questions. Uh, Richard, why did the yield on the 10-year uh, decline this week due to an expectation of deflation at the same time intermediate and five-year prices went up short answer richard don't know because bonds are crazy things i mean what we might be seeing is just simple arbitrage where on the the, the, the one side they were selling the one and buying the other end but in essence in a perfect world yeah you're right if inflation is moving up etc there should be interest in bonds and the like what we do see However, is that there has literally been a 30-year bull market in U.S. bonds, which saw their tenure trading at, did it go sub 1% to 1 point? I can't remember, um, in, in, in February, April. But certainly what we have been seeing is massive buying of, of U.S. treasuries. And, and as I said, that's partly the Federal Reserve, but it's also just investors who consider uh, U.S. treasury bills to be the safest investment in the world. Um, and still paying positive rates. If you're heading off to Europe, you are going to get negative rates uh, if you're buying uh, ECB and other such bonds, which is, uh, well, yes, deeply less attractive. Terry, you're asking, should you as a 26, should, do you need to have bonds in your portfolio as a 26-year-old? I'm going to say no. I will tell you that a lot of conventional wisdom disagrees with me. There's one theory that your portfolio should be 60% equity, 40% bonds to reduce volatility. Another theory says take either 100 or 120 because we live longer, less your age, and put that amount in equity and the rest into bonds. But I would say, you know, unless you have short-term cash needs, in which case you want a fixed income or a government bond like they're offering, um, I don't necessarily think you need bonds until you're closer to retirement. Remember also is that if you have a retirement annuity, pension, or provident fund, they will be Reg 28. They will already have bonds included. How is interest reflected in bond index tracker price? Alan, short answer, it's not. I mean, in, the, in terms of the coupon rate, they're buying the index. Uh, the all bond index, uh, uh, ALBI, we could go and dig around and find a yield for that index broadly. Um, the way we track it is just looking at the distributions being paid out. Of course, some aren't. So if I'm on, and maybe I'm misunderstanding it reflected in the, in the tracker price. So, so they're paying out those that are reinvesting. You don't see it at all.
EJ, if you buy bonds on the SAGov website and sell before five years, do you still get 11.5% yield? Yes, EJ, you can sell after one year with penalty. And as I understand that penalty is you forfeit the current interest that you are receiving for that period. Um, so if you're a pensioner over 65 and getting your interest monthly, you forfeit one month interest. If you're getting it biannual, you forfeit this up to six months of interest. You can, there is a form I have seen that lets you try and withdraw within one month. Sorry, within a year, in other words, in the first year of opening the product, um, and that, quite simply, you need a very good reason. Uh, you know, like my spouse died or something like that. Not sure if losing your job would. So you can exit early. There is a penalty fee for it. What you can also do is, after the first year, is you can reset. So if the rate is higher, you can reset into the new rate, but it'll also reset your duration. So if you're in year two of a five-year period, you then reset for another five years. Um, Liesl, no. So Liesl says, will the 11.5 retail bond currently remain at that fixed rate regardless? So if you enter whilst they're offering 11.5, it is fixed and you will receive it for the duration. So that part, yes. If you go and buy it this afternoon and it's still been offered 11.5, and as I understand, the change won't happen until end of the month, which is Thursday next week, um, you will get the 11.5 for the duration. It is fixed for the duration. But the amount they are offering can change. So come May next month, I think there will be a lower rate because, as you point out, the interest has gone below nine. But if you're in at 11 and a half, you will get that 11 and a half for the period. Absolutely, you will. Cool. Ladies and gents, not seeing any more questions coming through. We will park it there. Remember all of these videos, the Monday ones, the Wednesday ones, all of them going onto the YouTube channel. Just hit youtube.com, search standard online share trading. The URL is down there, but that is not a fun URL to type in. So just go hit on, just go search standard online share trading. No bank, just standard online share trading, and you will hit the YouTube vids. It's typically up about an hour or so thereafter. Ladies and gents, uh, long weekend. Enjoy. Stay safe. Uh, and we'll chat again next week. Uh, I see quick questions coming through. Uh, CJ, that's a good question. Would the yield not go up end of April because we moved out of the World Government Bond Index? In other words, people would be selling and that would push a yield higher. You would expect that. Um, the question is how much selling versus how much buying. So there is a chance that towards the tail end of next week and into the first week of May, we actually see that yield rise again from 9% as the sellers exit the World Government Bond Index, uh, which is run by City. Um, of course, we then fall into the non-investment grade. In the World Government Bond Index, we are a tiny fish at the bottom of the, of, of, of the pile, um, you know, just a couple of percentage points. We now drop into the non-investment grade or the junk club, if you want to call it. We're a giant fish in that junk, junk, junk club. Do they offset? I don't know, but uh, the bond yields will tell us over the, over the week ahead. Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there. Everyone, stay safe. Wash your hands. We'll chat again next week. Cheers, all.